All right, folks, let's get started. Uh, the next thing we're going to do in BJTs is the coupled diode model. Um, I'll get to that in a second, but the images I have today, there's two of them. Uh, this is a zoom-out image of a some sort of thing. I'll leave it at that. And here's a zoom-in image of it. And this is from 1958. What is this? This is a really important uh, historical moment. Well, if you read below, you'll see that this is the first integrated circuit. And the first integrated circuits used BJT technology. It is actually a differential amplifier with five transistors. And it was uh, this one here was developed by Jack Kilby at TI. About the same time, uh, Robert Noyce at Fairchild also developed one. And it's interesting, you look at a first device, um, here's the circuit. The features are, are fairly large. But, you know, when you're testing the first device, this is kind of what it looks like, right? It's not professionally packaged and everything else. you got some epoxy here and looks like some soldering paste here. But you do what you can to get that first test up. And then again, you know, obviously by the time it gets to product, it's a much better packaged device. So a little bit of history there. Obviously, BJTs were not continually used for, the inter for more complicated integrated circuits like uh, microprocessors, and when we get to MOSFETs, you'll understand a little bit why. The biggest reason being that uh, BJTs just consume, consume too much power. The input to a BJT requires current, and if you had a computing chip that required current at all the transistors at the inputs form, it would get ridiculously hot. You just couldn't do it. Okay, so... We've shown a, a lot so far for the BJT. You should have a pretty good understanding of it. We've looked at all these different currents, the base current, the emitter current, the collector current, and we now understand how to relate them and their ratios. Last time we also derived these terminal currents, and so we had the emitter, the collector, and the base current, um, and we said the common terms, or this is basically reverse saturation current, if you steal a piece of N here. This is the regular old diode behavior where that's the voltage part of this and this basically is our ratios that give us actual amplification. So here's our launch point here. So let's say you're a BJT device engineer or integrated circuit and designer or your boss requests that you learn how to do this in one week. Well if that's the case there should be simpler ways than these equations to design the BJT into your circuits for various applications. I mean, are you going to take a really simple network type circuit with resistors, capacitors, etc., and then try to plug in there these hyperbolic trig functions and everything else? Probably not. You want something that looks even simpler in terms of the circuit implementation. Furthermore, up to this point, we had mostly assumed that the emitter base is forward biased and the base collector was reverse biased. But, you know, there's nothing to say that you couldn't run the BJT backwards, right? I could have the collector do the emitting and the emitter be the collector potentially. And in some circuits, you want that level of flexibility. So let me ask you this. Should we go through all the derivations again? Well, after seeing last, the last lecture, you'll probably say no. You don't want to go through all those derivations. Let's instead develop a simple circuit model like this that's based on really simple parts like a diode, a current source, another diode here, and a current source. That's pretty simple. And this model's cool because I can run it in either direction for the currents, and it's easy to plug into a circuit and understand how it works. And so this is called the coupled diode model, and it's called a coupled diode model because I've got a diode here and I've got a diode here, and they're coupled at one common circuit point here. Okay? And this is just one of many models, okay? We're only going to do one. So this, if you see other models, don't be like, oh, I didn't teach us this, we can do one, but they're all, many of them are based off similar principles, okay? So here's how we're going to do this. Just like last time, we're first going to look at the base region under some conditions we've not considered yet, and we'll define some new terms. Once again, this is going to get very complicated, but it's going to get really simple at the end as well. So it's like a similar journey to the, uh, to the last lecture. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I'm going to look at a BJT here in normal forward active mode, and everything should look familiar here. I've got P plus N and P type material. My emitter base, base is forward biased. My collector base is reverse biased. 
If I look at my whole concentration across the base, I'm plotting whole concentration across the base here, I get an excess delta PE on this side because this is forward biased and bringing the holes over. And at the base edge here, WB, the concentration goes to zero because this is the cliff edge, right? This is the edge of the uh, depletion region where all those holes are swept across to the other side. And of course, delta PE is dependent on the emitter base voltage, VEB, right? That makes sense too, okay? So, what I want you to notice is that there's also a solution for doing this thing backwards, okay? So in this case, now the collector base is forward biased, positive voltage on the P side, negative on the N side, so then I'm, my collector is doing the emitting, and now I have reverse biased my emitter base. If I were to do that, and I look at my whole concentration across the base, on the WB side, on this side, I'm injecting over the holes, I would get an excess, but now I call it delta PC, meaning the excess on the collector side of the base, and now the emitter's reverse bias, so I get zero concentration here because they're all falling off the cliff on that side, so there's zero, and there's my whole concentration across the base. Delta PC is diode-like just like delta PE. The only difference for delta PC is that it is dependent on the collector base voltage, right? We're forward biasing this diode to inject this excess delta PC, so its exponential diode behavior should be dependent on collector base voltage. Now, notice what I can do, and this is like what we had before, is that if I try to forward bias both the emitter base and the collector base, I can basically add the two solutions by superposition, and I get one solution here, okay? And so that's what we're going to do on the next slides. Now, the subscripts here in terms of current, this is I emitter current normal mode. That's what the N means. This is collector current in normal forward mode. And then you'll notice over here, I've got emitter current with subscript I, that's inverted mode, and collector current with subscript I, which is inverted mode. Now I know the holes are moving in this direction, so we already know right off the bat that when we calculate these, these will have a negative value because current's actually moving in this direction. But for now, we're basically going to keep them all pointed in the same direction in terms of positive X, knowing that, of course, that these have negative values that in this case holes are going this way and actual current flow is in this direction. Okay? All right. One last question before we uh, last two questions before we move on. And so we've talked about we've talked about this. Second question is what drives the current across the base? Well, remember, it's diffusion. So I have a high concentration, low high concentration here, low concentration here. This concentration gradient drives the holes by diffusion. And in this case, it drives the holes in this direction by diffusion. So you can already see some interesting things here, where if you try to forward bias the emitter base and collector base, you're going to start to eliminate that concentration gradient. And that's going to help us predict in the model what's going to happen. The last thing I want you to notice is, is why is the collector base forward hole injection less than the emitter base? Basically, why is delta PE greater than delta PC? Delta PE is greater than delta PC. Well, you should be able to look at that and realize it pretty easily. The reason why delta PE is greater is that this is heavily doped on the emitter, so when you forward bias this, you get more holes across because you have more holes to, to, to diffuse over versus this side, which is lightly doped, and so there are less holes to diffuse over when you forward bias this junction. Okay, so now let's just move some things around using the terminal currents we had before. So remember, we had previously showed this, and I, I've changed the color systems a little bit, so just reset the color systems in your mind. Here's my emitter current, here's my collector current. Now, if we assume this thing is geometrically symmetric, meaning the area here and the area here, the area throughout is the same, then we could rewrite these equations as follows. I'm going to say that my emitter current in normal mode is A times delta PE, and A is just all this blue stuff, okay? So here's A, it's all the blue stuff and delta PE was just the yellow stuff here. I can do the exact same thing for my collector current in normal mode where B is just all the blue stuff we had before and I have delta PE still as well. And I know that in normal mode, right, delta PC is equal to zero, meaning that my delta PC on the collector side of the base in normal mode 
is 0 because that's a reverse bias junction. So delta PC is 0. Now let's look at inverted mode here. Okay? So in inverted mode, it's interesting, right? Now I'm going to be emitting with my collector and my emitter is going to do the collecting. This is the injection side and this is the collecting side. And so what I do is my emitter current in inverted mode is pretty simple. Instead of delta PE, it's delta PC because my excess here is delta PC instead. Okay, And furthermore, I'm forward biasing this junction and delta PC is a function of collector base voltage. So I need delta PC instead for this. Okay. Um, for my emitter. But now my emitter on this side is collecting, right? So my emitter is collecting, right? Well, if my emitter is collecting, then my emitter should have the hyperbolic trig function of the collector current. And that was B, right? This was the hyperbolic trig function in the I naught for the collector current. So I just give the emitter collecting capability and now I give the collector emitter capability it has the hyperbolic trig functions that we previously had for the emitter and of course the collector is also dependent on delta PC because all the excess is created for these equations is now on this side okay and for this inverted mode here for this inverted mode delta PE is equal to zero because this is reverse bias diode here and they're all falling off the cliff edge Okay. Last thing I'll note here is I put a minus sign out here. I, I promised you I would do this, right? If I'm saying my currents are in this direction, but I notice based on voltages, holes are going this way, then these must have negative values, and you can see the minuses out here. So you should be able to understand at this point why we switched the signs for these out front and why the A's and B's have been switched out for inverted mode. Okay, so again, let's add our solutions by superposition and include the normal and inverted modes, okay? So now my total emitter current I would have would be the combination of my emitter current in the normal mode and my emitter current in the inverted mode. And so I'll take the, the solutions I had on the previous slides and I'll just add them together here. Here's my normal mode, here's my inverted mode, okay? Remember, this is minus for the inverted mode because the current's actually in the opposite direction. And then what I'll do is I'm just going to re regroup some terms and I'm going to keep the diode parts here and then all the other stuff I'm going to express as capital A and capital B. So capital A, for example, is lowercase a times P sub n, where lowercase a is all this other stuff we had before. Okay, And there's capital B as well. I'm just substituting things around to make these equations look cleaner. Do the same thing for collector current. My collector current, as I'm, as I'm trying to run this BJT backwards or forward bias both of these, will be the collector current in normal mode plus the collector current in inverted mode. Um, and you can start to see the same things I did here with the A's and the B's, making them capital A's and B's and these substitutions here. Okay. So what you could start to see is that you know some of these currents can cancel each other out. So if I have current in this direction and then subtracting current from the other direction you could see that if I'm trying to drive current in both directions it would cancel out the net current so these equations are already showing you that now there's one problem with this everything I've assumed here so far is for a symmetric BJT meaning that doping on this side and this side are the same but we can see that our doping levels are not equal for our emitter and collector so how are we going to account so, how can we account for the asymmetric case of heavily doped emitter, base, and collector lightly doped? Well, here's our equations we came up with. Let's look inside there. So inside the A's and the B's, I've got this P sub n. Could I account for asymmetry there? Well, I can't, right? Because P sub n is the minority carrier hole concentration in the base. And whether or not the emitter and collector doping has changed, that doesn't change the minority hole concentration in the base. So that doesn't work. What about the hyperbolic trig functions here, the WB over LP? Could I account for the asymmetry there? No, once again, these are with the base. And it does, the base is determined by base doping and base width, which has nothing to do with the doping levels, you know, being P plus or P out here, okay? Assuming that the, yeah, that's a reasonable approximation. 
However, we know that the reverse saturation currents need not be the same for the emitter base and the collector base. If you change the doping levels on either side, the I naughts can be changed. And so what we're going to do for the asymmetric case of one side more heavily doped than the other is we will account for different reverse saturation currents for each junction. So I will have, for normal mode, I will have IES, okay? And for the collector in inverted mode, which is my new, in inverted mode, the collector is doing the emitting, I'll have a different I naught out front minus ICS, okay? The key point being that IES and ICS are not equal. Different I naughts for the those two diodes on either side of the base. I can also account for the asymmetry with the current transfer ratios. And so I will have a current transfer ratio for normal mode where emitter current in normal mode is turned by current transfer ratio into collector current. And then in inverted mode, my collector's doing the emitting, right? So I have an inverted mode collect current transfer ratio which turns that emitted collector current into a collected emitter current. I know the terminology is a little complicated when I say these things, but uh, try, to, try to keep up best you can. Key point, my current transfer ratios for normal and in inverted mode are not equal. So now we have all four equations that are asymmetric. We will take our four results and we'll do the same thing. We're going to add them by superposition here and we get the famous Abers-Mole equations here. Okay. And so these are the equations which allow you to operate the diode in either bias on the emitter base and collector base. Furthermore, but we're, not, we're going to skip this part of the proof, you could show that your current transfer ratio for normal mode times I0 for the emitter side is equal to the current transfer ratio for inverted mode times I0 on the collector side. Okay. So let's do something with these equations now. So, I'm going to rewrite these equations using terms we've seen before. So I'm going to substitute these in. The reason why I want to do it, I want to get rid of all these terms. If I could get rid of these terms and just write them as delta PE and get rid of this and write it as delta PC, things are going to get simpler. And so I'll take these equations, I'll substitute this here with delta PE, and I end up with this simplifying to IES delta PE over P sub N, right? This is equal to this here, which means I move P sub n to the other side, delta PE over P sub n. There it is right there, okay? And I do the same for the other terms. I'll do the same for the collector current. You can look through this and see how the math works out. Simple enough. And if I do that, okay, and I start drawing, drawing a circuit, I'm going to get a circuit that looks like this, okay? And I'll explain, not right now, but in, in a second, why I have diodes and why I have current sources and why they're pointed in the directions they are. So this is just a representation of these equations. Okay. So at this point, I want you to do this review, then take a quick break, and I will start to break this down and make sense of it. First question is, the whole point of deriving the coupled diode model is so we could put the BJT in a circuit using even simpler circuit components than a BJT like this simple circuit diagram we see over here at the right. Because we can now basically bias this circuit in any direction as well. So we want simpler components and we can bias in either direction. Is that true or false? I think that's a pretty easy question. I just want to remind us of that. Is, you know, was that our motivation to, uh, to start with? Next question. For a P plus N P B J T, asymmetric doping, the reverse saturation currents for normal and inverted modes are either the same or are they different? For P plus N BJT, how about the current transfer ratios? Are they the same or different for the inverted and normal modes? Next question. The delta PC term in the diagram at right here, this delta PC term that you see here, is that dependent on emitter base voltage, collector base voltage, or collector emitter voltage? And you'll need to know this before we go into the next part of the lecture. Okay? Last question. Let's assume this is symmetrically doped. PNP, emitter and collector dopings are identical. 
What about those reverse saturation currents and the current transfer ratios? For their normal and inverted modes, would they be the same or different? So go through these, take a break, and then we'll come back and finish this off.